thank you very much. I, uh, in order not to delay uh, things, maybe we should just um, start the roundtable discussion. I just want to uh, remind everybody, if they don't mind, just uh, filling out the questionnaire, uh, which is in the chat. And um, thank you very much for all of you uh, participants, the panelists, for being here. If you want to open your um, cameras, then we can see you all. And we'll try to go in order. Um, I don't know if to just um, tackle first the questions that were left from the, the previous sessions, which were, I think, majority of, there were some related to serine, but there were other questions too about structure. And uh, so I'm, I'm just going to start hitting. And Amela, please interrupt me if I forgot a question or something, and feel free. Um, uh, there were some uh, families uh, asking how long would a child, their child would need, to, sorry, would need to take Elserine for it to have an effect. And for how long is it for life? Well, well according to the experience that we have, and the, the, well, the positive effects in some of the, the aspects of neurodevelopment um, in, for most children are, are seen um, quite fast. I mean, in the first couple, two, three months after starting taking serine, it is possible to see already some kind of um, I mean, improvement in different aspects. And anyway, we, we have the, our experience is, is just uh, uh, very initial, so we have little experience. That's why we are now uh, conducting the clinical trial just to, to, to have more patients and, and see how, how is the pattern. Uh, it, it is true that probably because it is not only the action of uh, L-serine into the NMDA receptor to activate it, but also a uh, mm, recomposition of metabolism uh, because L-serine is also a precursor of sphingolipids uh, for, for um, neuronal membranes that it, it also participates in, in, in an, a particular energetic pathway and so on. It is possible that uh, for serine uh, for a, a long time uh, has other effects that we still don't know that can be can improve also other functions and be beneficial uh, uh, for, for a long time. If, if for a patient is, is, has a positive effect, we don't have any reason to remove L serine. Um, in the, um, it is the same situation for other metabolic disorders or other conditions where L serine it can be um, uh, administered for forever. I mean, it, it, it doesn't have a negative effects. So yeah, it, it, if it, this has a positive effect, it can be given forever. Um, this question is kind of for both of you, Amy and, and Angels. Um, this is, are there any L-serine testing in mice and they're going in mice? Yes. Um, so we've been, we've been chatting in, in other, uh, you know, We've been having discussions about what would be the right dose. Chavi's done work in in mice, haven't you? Uh, Chavi done done some L serine treatments in mice. Oh, not not yet. <laughs> this oh, is, okay. We are, we are waiting okay. for the approval from the ethicals committee. Okay. Okay. Great. Hopefully, so, we'll start uh, January twenty twenty one. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry, I, I misunderstood. Then, um, mm. so we've had mice on the diet for two months. We've had um, the knockdown mice on the diet for two months, and we are going to start testing this week. So uh, I wish that I had some answers for you, but so far so good. They're they're doing fine. And, you know, no one's no one's. Um, looks worse but we, we haven't done the, the test yet so I'll, I'll well i will be happy to convey this to how however i i you know however would be best i'll i'll spread the news and <laughs> Thank you. Uh, one, just a comment that is important and because of the half life of l serine um, it is important that l serine has to be um given a, at least three times a day so with uh, um, because of the whole life of l serine uh, that the drops uh, the, the the kinetics on, on blood and if you don't take l serine for more than I mean, six hours or so uh, you don't have the the proper effect so if you took take all the necessary dose in a day but just once a day 
it doesn't have the same effect that if you um, divide the, do the, the doses of the total day at least in three doses, three or four, better four doses, we will be more recommended. There is a very recent paper by Carlos Ferreira explaining that because Elserin is given now more and more for different uh, situations, uh, clinical situations. So this is like a, an important message. We just, in, in our protocol for the clinical trial, it is like that, but just, I, I say that, uh, that just in case somebody is taking Elsari in, in an independent way. <laughs> so this is an important message. I have also a question about the Elsari trial. Um, the, 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 there's a family asking if you have a placebo arm in the clinical trial. So people who are not taking and you're comparing side by side. No, no. We this is probably the, this is the best way to do a clinical trial. But the problem is that we don't have um, uh, too uh, much patients. We we have just the, the sample of patients is small. So if we do that, uh, finally we will end up with uh, very very few patients, and the results will will not have, will not be uh, strong enough or so robust enough. So we we have tests. Um, like development or, or the, the normal pattern of development for some time before l serine and we compare uh, the well, uh, in the, the same uh, child uh, which what is the evolution after uh, taking l serine in uh, compared to the normal pattern of development before l serine but uh, we don't have enough patients to do this uh, uh, placebo it will would have been the, the best situation but no Thank you. Um, now move with something else. How much is known about the expression of different subunits um, and different cell types? So I guess that maybe for Dr. Wen. <laughs> so the expression of green in, in different cell types and the different subunits. Uh, so we, uh, we haven't tested that in all the cell types yet, but definitely in the, in the neurons, uh, uh, that differentiate from the iPA cells, we can we, we did the Western block before. That uh, we can see that an uh, one, an two B, and an two D are expressed. And yes, but uh, we haven't tested that in other cell time yet. I have a I have an interesting thing. I um I didn't include this because it was um very technical and but i it might be interesting to show can i share my screen for just a second um what this is is this is in the mouse uh, can you see this mm -hmm. um okay so this is you know similar it looks similar to what uh, uh jay singh showed for the um brain organoid but this was done with 20 organs from the mouse and and so on the left you can see all the different cell types in in the mouse and these are not different organs these are cell types so for example these are all adipose tissue this is all adipose cells that are found in the many different organs and then on this side over here what i have um i asked to look for the expression of GRIN1. So this is the expression of NMDA receptors, or at least GRIN1, um, in all the different cells. And so you see, of course, that they're brightest in neurons, but in the beta cells of the pancreas, they're also pretty bright. Um, and uh, this is epithelial cells here. Um, these are basal cells in the tongue, um, in adipose tissue, and these are T cells here. These are microglia here. These are astrocytes here. So I guess what I wanted to show you is that even though they are certainly highest expressed in neurons, they are out also found in other cells of the body. Oh, these are your B cells here. These are the um, progenitor B cells and these are the um, mature B cells. So um, the idea that they could be expressed on immune cells is, is you know, at least in mice, there's evidence. Now, this kind of technique um, does not, is not as easy to do in, in humans, <laughs> when postmortem tissue as it is in, in mice, but, but there is certainly evidence that it's expressed in other cell types besides the brain. Yeah, thank you, Amy. Actually, I, I want to 
say that also we, we did the single cell RNA seq for the for the human brain organoids, and we can put out the data for all the subunits to see uh, their expression in different cell time. Yeah, that would be interesting. Be interesting compare. I'm sorry, Christian just pointed out that there were. Um, a few more questions for the serene that i didn't address and one of them maybe i'll lump them up um what are the foods that contain serene i, I know natalia briefly mentioned them um uh and if if you don't know gain of function and loss of function would you still profit from taking l serene or is it better to get a, a proper uh, functional diagnosis um, where to get L-serine, uh, it's expensive, um, et cetera. And, um, and if, again, going back to the, if it's only used on loss of function, so. Yeah, but uh, according to the, the foods that are rich uh, in L-serine, the world, there are several, many of them, you can probably find it uh, better uh, quantified in, in web pages that are, and, and applications uh, for diets that um, very uh, that have exactly the the content in grams, uh, etc. So, but but in, um, I think one of the most uh, um, uh, rich um, uh, foods in in El Serene is uh, some kind of meats like uh, turkey, also eggs, um, soy proteins. Um, I mean, these are some of the most rich, but then there are several other foods that you, you can easily find in, in, in web pages that uh, quantify uh, different um, amino acids and, and, and other uh, components of the food in, in, in every uh, kind of uh, product. I mean, this is very easily easy to find. Um, but this is one, then it, to, yes, l serine should be theoretically used in loss of function. We, we don't have, uh, I mean, any, the, the, the rationale for giving that in, in gain of function, well, it is not um, established. I mean, it is just to activate the receptors that doesn't work properly, that are down, that work quite slow and, 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 and worse. So if you give l in, in gain of function, you won't have the, the the necessary effect. Maybe you have other effects like the those that I already mentioned, the um, or, or the the remodelation of lipids of membranes and the energy aspects. But that we we don't know. We, we just don't know. So it is preferred to, first of all to know if it is a, a gain of function or a loss of function before starting. And then the other question was where to where, where can be found L, L serine in in the internet or a, well a, there are well several um, um, I mean sites where we can find it first of all what Nutritia you you have the the web page from Nutritia I don't know if you as a parent or as a, uh, any person can 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 buy it uh, in independently from a hospital. We just uh, uh, ask the, the dietitians in our hospital to send a nutrition, uh, the elserine from nutrition to every patient, and this is for free in Spain. But well, I don't know how does it work in in other countries. I think that I I, I guess in other countries it is not the same, or at least not in all countries is is like that, like a, a prescription, like a medical prescription. Otherwise, maybe a person as an individual, a patient can also ask an, an nutritia for um, elsewhere in to receive it at home. But then there are other. Um, uh, other sites, uh, other trademarks, marks that have also apparently uh, an, um, a high purity and that are, I mean, they can be, uh, um, uh, I mean, administered without any problem because it, it seems that, well, the, the purity is, is high. We, we have, uh, I think, a web page that we can share uh, later on if you want, Sandra, that, that was given also to, uh, to us from other researchers. Uh, that maybe well, it is also um, interesting for patients. Hmm. Yeah, and I think maybe we should add again, uh, if you uh, are going to take the serine, talk to your neurologist. Uh, if you need your neurologist to get in touch with you guys, 
we can you know provide you with the, the email contact because i think this is the way the best way to do it and then they can monitor your child accordingly um if they you want you can do previous testing kind of what you're doing in the clinical trial and you are getting some patients i know from other countries that want to join and basically they what what they do is just follow the protocol of the, of the clinical trial so I think that's that's also important. So I think hopefully we covered all the Delta serine ones <laughs> so far. Um, now I'll just go. Um, um, so there was a question um, also about the symptoms, um, and if you see the same symptoms with with the same protein change, or I, I should say the same amino acids change. So when you have a missense mutation, if it's in the same position, uh, would you see basically the same symptoms? Is the same symptoms for the same mutations all the time uh, well, it mm -hmm. doesn't happen normally in any other kind of genetic disease as well sometimes yes you have a correlation between the genotype and the phenotype in some case some occasions and uh, but this is not uh, something that uh, uh, happens uh, always this is not a constant yeah it can vary mm -hmm. Um, this yes, is a, a point that I would have. Oh, sorry, I'm please sorry. go ahead, Mireya. It's, it's just that what, what it's, maybe what we see is that there are some important positions, some positions that are really conserved and are essential positions. And then when these positions are the mutate one, then usually no, the, the phenotype is more severe. No? And then there's, we have seen some really slight changes in, in the physical chemical properties of the amino acids and in some positions that are not really important. And then in this case, the, the, the phenotype seems that to be uh, more uh, mild, no? less severe. But it's just a general no? observation. Uh, this is why we need really no? a patient registry and to, no? to know all the information from the child. And, and, and then we'll be sure no? to make a correlation of severity and to the, the clinical symptom related to some positions in, in the protein and to some amino acid changes. Just a point related to that. Um, it's quite possible, likely, no, that other mutations, other polymorphisms, not, not disease-defining polymorphisms across the rest of the genome, will be modulating the symptoms of green uh, but, uh, mutation. So other, other genes that are slightly different from people to people uh, may enhance or weaken the effect of a green mutation. In that context, Shashin, would it be, what, what do you think? Is it better to isolate the mutations and use one backbone cell line to put in your different green mutations and grow 384 brains at the time with different greens, but all in the same backbone? Or do you need to look at IPS from, from patients? We'll use both. both. We'll use both. So, uh, uh... We, we always generate the, the, the patient IP cell line, but next step, uh, we, are, we will do the isogenic line by, introduce, by introducing the same mutation to a, a healthy, uh, and to do a control backbone. And, but on the other hand, we also will uh, uh, correct the mutation in the, in the case IP cells to uh, convert to the, to the white time. So we will have two type of two different type of isogenic line. One is the correction, and one is the um, uh, we call the locking. Yeah. Okay. I I think I would I would second that. Just that we're we're all more than one single gene, and what makes us you know who we are is is not whether the, our status at just the one gene you know clearly. So how that expresses is going to be different depending on your own unique. Um, you know, genotype and, and everything that, that makes you, you. Um, and we see this in the mice too. The mice, we have them all on the exact, they are all identical twins. So they're all on the same genetic background, but we can move that mutation onto different genetic backgrounds. And we see that the, the phenotype of the mice can become worse or can become better depending on which genetic background we use. And so we have to use actually a, a special genetic background in order to get the mice, the knockdown mice, to thrive and to, to 
you know, to live. Um, if we put them on certain genetic backgrounds, they, they don't live. Um, and if we put them on other genetic backgrounds, you know, they're, they're even more robust. So uh, that's, we've already seen this in mice. So it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at all that, that depending on all of your other genes, you would have a more or less severe phenotype. Yeah, and I think your data, what you showed in the mice with the various tests, actually I was surprised how diverse they performed. You know, the, the standard deviation in your columns was quite amazing, given that these are identical twins, one to the other, uh, yet they perform quite differently now, even in that setting. Yes, I, I imagine for an immunologist that data probably looks really dirty. <laughs> but um, yeah, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> that's the thing you know i wish i had a blood test i wish i had you know i wish i could do what you do because you know that yes the mice depending on whether they got in a fight that day or you know whether they just ate or whether they've been you know it, it, we just we don't know all the things that that make them choose to behave a certain way but it's not just that you know it's not just even their genetic background yeah. You know, it's, and it also impacts our kids, you know, to exact that degree, whether they have eaten well in the morning or slept well at night. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Exactly. We have a question about a binding. Um, so if you have a mutation on the binding side of glutamate and you use an agonist, would you actually see a benefit uh, because, of course, you would only act on the healthy uh, receptor, which you might already have decreased because you don't have the binding site. So I don't know if anybody wants to take this one. So the question is about uh, those mutations that affect the glutamate binding site and that the, uh, there is uh, an absence of binding. But uh, I think the, the, the strategy uh, is focusing on, on, the, on the wild type uh, subunit that is still present in in some part of the of the receptors in a pool of the receptors. So this this is not affected by the, the variant. Only those that have the, the mutation will be unable to bind glutamate. So we will focus on those that are working properly, and then the idea is to potentiate those that are, are responding to glutamate. The other ones, of course, will be not responsive. I think just to, to, to clarify that question, um, I think that uh, the question was m more because uh, I know it's known that if you have a mutation on the binding side, and that's the, that's the issue with the whole NDA receptor, that you will focus on the on the functioning one. But are there like any approaches, or are are are, the, are there any work be, being done on the dysfunctional receptor where the mutation causes? the inability to bind glutamate. Okay, now I catch the question. So yeah. trying to uh, act directly on the mutant. This is pretty difficult. So we, we, well, we and pharmacologists have a lot of difficulties to develop new compounds that are uh, having a, a beneficial effect on NNDA receptors. So we can imagine that uh, de designing new compounds that will interact with these mutant receptors that have an affected glutamate binding site is, is very, very complicated. Uh, it, it means a lot of effort for a single variant. And since there are many different uh, variants, it is, it is almost, mm, that, well, it's very challenging. So I think that most of the people are focusing uh, just in, in a set of, 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 uh, of receptors, the wild types. Okay, so, so just to understand this correctly, does that mean that, because uh, how I understand it, that different variants can cause the same um, dysfunction on, on, on the NMDA receptor. So there are different variants that cause the inability to bind glutamate. And um, so if we assume that activation of an NMDA receptor requires glutamate binding, there will be a group of variants that will have the same issue, right? So it's not specific variants, but a group of variants that will have a same, you know, the same issue. So this is this is this is merely so. So I know that it's difficult. I'm just interested in, in knowing whether there is any work being done in that, you know, because at all, as I understand it, there are 
there are quite a few variants that actually cause in a inability to bind glutamate. Mm. Um, so if the overall approach for kind of those, this type of, 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 of mutation is simply just focus on enhancing the normal copy uh, and not so much focusing on fixing the, the bad one. <laughs> Yes, I think that this is the idea because uh, even if, if they are affecting the same pocket, the glutamate uh, binding uh, domain, uh, in terms of the molecular, uh, I mean, well, the amino acids that are affected and, and the changes in the structure, they are pretty different. So you are affecting the same domain, but these, uh, the amino acids that are affected are different. And then uh, if you develop a drug, this is very, there is a very tight interaction, so it's not any any kind of, of compound will not bind to the different mutations affecting the same uh, domain. So perhaps, uh, Mireya, you want to add something in, in terms of structure and... Oh yeah, I think in the, the same way. So yes, um, for sure there will be, I guess, in the future, no, maybe the groups of, of variants. So looking at lots of function variants, we have those that are um, avoiding the subunits interactions. There will be some of them, no, that will be related to avoiding glutamate binding. Some of them will be in the transmembrane region. Some of them will be just um, really uh, at the bottom of the receptor. And then maybe in this case, if we have in the future more available drugs, and these drugs are binding in different regions, we will be able to choose uh, different drugs according to the domain where the mutation is found. Um, but the other side, um, I think that if we have uh, a, a mutation that is uh, affecting the glutamate binding side, then probably working with positive allosteric modulators that uh, work at the, at the top of the receptor, um, we'll also have some problems. So um, I guess for the those that are glutamate binding, the, the best th thing is just to work on the wild type copy. But maybe there will be some drugs in the future that will act in different regions. Uh, we could even certify more the different variants, the uh, different lots of function variants. But now, right now, we don't know if we can uh, rescue the, the, the mutant receptor function um, for those that are avoiding the, uh, the binding of glutamate. I, I guess I just wanted to add about drug discovery. I mean, there's, there's kind of two ways you can approach it. One is a very rational one where you, you have the crystal structure and you can kind of fit in and try different drugs and, and predict that they're going to do something. But in general, we, we usually use screens where we're just looking for some signal that something has improved. And, and so um, it could be that we, when we do these screens, you know, I think Jay Singh, lots of people are, are developing platforms to do, um, to screen new drugs. There may be one that that ends up working that way, and and I guess this is why screening on several different variants will be valuable to see whether it works for all of them or it only works for one of them. But it probably won't be a rational kind of um, you know prediction. Although there are some people who are doing that, and I guess uh, Kira Grin is trying to pull in scientists from all different. Um, you know, discipline so that maybe there will be someone who will do that. But in general, the, the drug screens are, are kind of more just looking for a benefit and then, and then um, seeing how broadly it could benefit um, different variants. Yeah, and that's, that makes a perfect, you know, that makes sense, of course, uh, but it was just one of the thoughts that I had. If, you, if, 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 the, if the variant kind of um, is within that section where it actually affects the glutamate binding, so the, the, the purpose of looking for a drug that could give you a, a benefit, you know, it wouldn't make sense to look at the dysfunctional, you know, receptor, then you should focus on the enhancement you know, of the of the normal one, um, so maybe that's. Um, I, and I, I I don't know how many how many variants actually do um, do that, other than my sons. Uh, but um, I know that a few do. You know, a few of them do, and I think that that 
a lot of these a lot of the parents, even though they have an understanding of you know the function of of the NMD reset, but they don't actually understand what is what it means if their child has a variant that has you know that affects the glutamate binding um, site. Uh, so that I think hence the, all the questions about you know uh, would the alserine work if my child you know you know so so it's it's also more of a general question for you so that you can explain explain for all of the parents you know how how all of it works and and maybe that group of of of, of RIN patients you know they they are the they might be the most difficult ones to actually find a, a treatment for. Okay, um, we continue. I don't know, Amelia, you want to ask about the the mice? You also mentioned something about the mouse models of the uh, the binding. Well, oh, that wasn't my question. It was just a question from I don't remember who. I just yeah. No, no, there was somebody also asking if there yeah. were any mouse models uh, of of the with uh, with the binding um, the glutamate binding defect. And I don't know if that's the case of on, on the green to be in specific, but I don't know if you know of any of the other ones because I know you don't have any, Amy, but I don't know if you know of any of the other ones. I, I think there are some being developed. Um, um, Keith might know actually better than, than me. So the, the grim ones are mainly the ones I'm doing. So that's for the, you know, that would be more the glycine or serine site, but then um, for for the GRIN 2A or B, the glutamate, um, we have gain and loss of function, more loss than gain. Um, I know that people are developing this, so that list is now out of date and there are a lot more that have been developed. So we, we need to make a new list and find out, I think there are more mice even than that list shows. So I, I think it, there's a good chance that one of them will be a loss of function on either 2A or 2B, probably 2B, just because there it seems like there's more mice being made of 2B than 2A. Um, I have another question about um, gene editing, actually. Um, have the gene editing being considered in uh, the, as a treatment for green gene? Jay Singh, do you, are you uh, doing anything with your organoids? Yeah. We just use that as a tool for the research, but uh, you're talking about the gene therapy. Uh, so I think uh, uh, there's a couple things we need to think about. One is the uh, how uh, uh, how to deliver the the, the gene. I mean, uh, so uh, right now we see, I mean, for other disease or for other cases, people trying to use AAV, a different AAV or or, or other kind of virus. And uh, I think we uh, first need to test uh, uh, how efficient, uh, what's the efficiency for the delivery and, and whether there's other uh, side effect or, or toxicity. And, and also um, uh, need to figure out uh, what's the best time point what's the, uh, to, to, for, the, for the gene therapy. And I think to do that, maybe need to do some preclinical study before moving forward to the patient. For example, we use the animal models or use the primate models for test that out. Yes, Thank if you. I can add something. So uh, we heard a lot of this uh, promising uh, CRISPR and gene editing strategies and a few editions before of, of, of this uh, symposia. We also heard some presentations so there are a lot of hopes and, and social media are, are very, uh, they, they are stating that this is like the new uh, medicine, but to be, well, this is my opinion, but to be realistic, uh, thinking about uh, gene editing in, in vivo, in, in children uh, for neurological conditions, it is uh, perhaps uh, well too early to, to think about this. So, Right now, I think that the more realistic uh, options, and, and well, the physicians will correct me, but are those that have been presented as, as, as those compounds that are already in the market that can be reproposed, and also uh, tackling different aspects of, uh, of green disorder symptoms, as uh, Jenny Lee nicely presented. So there are many, many aspects that can be uh, addressed uh, in inflammatory or, or uh, in bioenergetics, 
or uh, well, as well as the ketogenic diet that Amy presented. And these are the real, uh, well, to me, uh, these are the real uh, points that need to be uh, uh, explored and, and to see really which are the, the, the benefits. Um, I'm going to answer a few more questions here. Uh, oh, sorry, not me, you. <laughs> I'm going to read them. Uh, so this is for Amy. Um, do you know um, ester protein glycosylation is altered in green knockout? Have you looked at it? Sorry. No, I don't have any information on that. Um, there is a new... Uh, there is a, a new investigator joining our department who specializes in um, protein glycosylation and all those enzymes that do that. So maybe we can find out something about that. But at this point, I, I have no evidence that there's any change there. Um, we have another question for Dr. Ramsey. And this is, um, I know that Xavi and Dr. Garcia mentioned a few um, chemicals that they were trying or at least they were studying uh, for children and they were wondering if you actually have tried something similar. Um, I guess the, there's some numbering and in, uh, including the L-serine, which you already uh, answered and the piracetam, um, if you have uh, tried that uh, on your mice. No, I haven't. And um, I mean, uh, we we had a meeting where um, Dr. Garcia Cazola said that uh, we could consider adding um, spermidine in um, spermidine or spermine. I can't remember which one it was, um, but but I the only one that we've done so far is the L-serine, and um, I haven't tried any other. Um, so the other medicines that we're trying right now is um, CBD, uh, cannabidiol, and um, THC, and combinations of those. And we're going to be feeding them uh, cookie dough uh, every day for two weeks, and um, and then testing them in in seizure and in um, you know some cognitive tests, and and also look at their sleep patterns. So that's the I would say that the, the L-serine and the cannabinoids are the ones that we're looking at right now, but, um, but there are so many that we, that we could and should be testing. And, and I think that having, you know, this is where uh, the parent organizations can help inform us and let us know what are the priorities for the patients? What do you, what are you most concerned about that we could, attack and, and, and focus on those things so that we're doing, using our time the best way we can. Perfect, thank you. There's another question for you also. Um, I have, uh, can we consider BHB and ketogenic diet, uh, not only for green one, but only green two? Yes, I, I don't see any reason why that would be limited to uh, green one because it's not, um, it has nothing to do directly with the GRIN one. So I would, I would say it would be more um, appropriate. It would, at this point, we've only looked at it in um, loss of function kind of scenarios, um, but I have no information about gain of function scenarios. So I would say that that would be the, the more, um, I, I don't have any answer about gain of function, but um, at this point, we're testing it in loss of function scenarios, but I, I don't think that it would be limited to GRIN1. Another question for Dr. Ramsey. Um, <laughs> GRIN1, uh, that you're testing on GRIN1 mice, um, you see a higher locomotor uh, activity, but you talk about energetic deficits. How do you explain that? <laughs> right, so, um, well, well, actually, I think there's a bit of a, conundrum there because I, I think that when the, we look at brain activity and we look at neuron firing, the neurons are actually firing more than less. And this might be one area where it's different than what Jay Singh sees in the, um, in the organoid where they're, you know, they're getting beautiful um, nutrition, you know, and they're getting everything that they need. They're bathed in this constant, perfect environment, right? Um, but, but the neurons are firing more, but if there's a problem with, um, 
energetics, then, then that's going to have more long-term uh, problems in terms of the neurons being able to maintain their, um, their ability to fire and their ability to carry out all of their different tasks that they're going to run out of energy because the more a neuron fires, that's very energetically demanding. And so more firing means it needs more energy. And if it can't get the energy, then ultimately there's going to be a failure and, and that could be the neuron dying or, or not working. And, um, so, the, so the the more activity is is probably more firing of certain neurons. Um, but I, I I think that that's the bioenergetic deficit would be something that we'd see more long term in terms of neurons um, failing and dying. And I don't so I don't think that would be reflected in in the running behavior. We have a few more questions. Um, there was a question about the association between hyperactivity and gain of function. If anybody wants to comment on it. I, I have one mouse that's a gain of function mouse and it does not have the same hyperactivity. Um, so we saw a mild hyperactivity in the juvenile mouse. It went away at um, when they became adults. And then when we tested them at one year, um, it looks like there is some hyperactivity, which, you know, they also having more seizures at one year. So this is with the gain of function mice. So they do seem to be different in, in many domains. So, so they, the hyperactivity is one where it seems like that they're different. Can I, can I add to this? So of course I've only been studying the acute effects of uh, inhibiting the receptor. But as, as I showed, there is hyperactivity when you block the NMDA receptor acutely. Uh, and also we've seen uh, increased pyramidal cell firing when, uh, when giving a, a ketamine or PCP to, to rats. So, so the acute effect of, of inhibiting the NMDA receptor is, is actually hyperactivity, which is a bit thought provoking. Yeah, that, that actually might be a question here for you to um, start on. It's, um, some parents have actually seen that kids um, experience low sensitivity to anesthetics. Um, and, you know, could this be explained by the NMDA receptor? Um, and I think also some of them, in, in, I would add to this, that even the pain, uh, you know, sensation seems to be also out there in most of these children. Yes. So I'm not a doctor, uh, but based on the, the mechanisms, uh, it, it makes sense. Uh, many uh, anesthetics uh, inhibit the, uh, the NMDA receptor uh, and uh, ketamine is also used for, for pain treatment. So, so that could definitely uh, play a role in pain sensation. Angel, have you seen? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, I just, uh, I, I always have to add that uh, what is uh, giving the symptoms is, is also to a large degree the compensation uh, of the loss of function, I think. So uh, as, as we also have seen today, uh, there's so many glutamate receptors, so uh, they can somehow compensate. And, and this may also uh, be part of the, the disease you see. And I just want to add that I also in, was mentioned in one of the chat groups um, that some of the kids after the anesthetics had like a period of being very calm, very relaxed, like a reboot reset. I think we spoke with Amel about it, you know, like you're resetting the, the craziness that's going on in the brain. Yes, so, so this is a, this is a well-known uh, phenomenon with, uh, with the ketamine uh, and, uh, and, and also other uh, anesthetics uh, that you may get like a feeling of high when you wake up. Um, and it's, I mean, but this is, this is based on, um, on this acute uh, inhibition of, of the NMDA receptors of potentially other systems as well. Thank you. Um, there are uh, families that have seen deletion, uh, deletion mutations um, that lead to specific phenotypes, like a more milder form of uh, you know, disease. 
um, and a milder form of autism and hyperactivity. Um, is this also seen in mice? I guess that's for Amy. <laughs> Yeah, so there was um, there was a paper published, I want to say in 2000, and the first author is spelled K-E-W, and they did something where they had uh, point mutations, and they also had um, just straight knockout. And um, it did seem that the point mutation had a more severe phenotype than the knockout. So I think that um, that, that would be consistent with the idea that that um, it it was actually no. I'm sorry, I'm saying this wrong. So a heterozygote with a point mutation was uh, had a more severe phenotype than a heterozygote with a null mutation. So the null would be like the deletion, and and so you know probably your kids just have one. Um, one version of the gene has a variant and the other version is, is normal. And so um, that would be what we would call a heterozygote. And so, yes, there, there is some evidence for that in mice that, that it, actually these point mutations are acting in what we would call a dominant negative fashion, that they're having an effect on the they have an oversized effect on, you know, it's not like you would have half of the receptor. It, and I think it's because they combine together as a, as a complex that, you know, just having one, um, you know, misfunctioning subunit is enough to affect the whole group, right? So really in order to get a functioning receptor, you need, you know, all of those subunits to be working properly. Thank you. I'm going to combine these two questions um, about serine. Um, how, one of them is um, if you have already normal levels of serine in the blood, or I guess in this case will be the CSF, um, is there a, a reason to supplement? And I will combine it with what, what, how is the dosage determined uh, for L-serine? And I would assume are the papers and, and the medical literature. And, and where that is piracetam? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All of our patients have normal levels of L-serine because there is no problem in the biosynthesis in the production of L-serine by by the body. Or so this is uh, always normal. Uh, there are some uh, rare disorders, uh, metabolic disorders that have this impairment in L-serine biosynthesis, and and in these patients we 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 find a, a, a depletion of L-serine in plasma and in the CSF. In green patients, have normal levels of all kinds of amino acids. There is no problem of synthesis, but still we give a more quantity, or well, a high quantity of L-serine because we, we want to obtain this agonist effect on the NMDA receptor. So we can monitor for sure the L-serine levels after starting treatment. This is not a strictly necessary Necessary, but we can monitor that just in order to see the treatment is, is performed currently according to the recommendations and also for research purposes if, if we want. But yeah, even with normal levels of L-serine, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll give that because we want to have this action of uh, potentiating the, the receptor. Um, so this, this, this was the question. And then the other question was, uh, uh, Sandra? Was another question about piracetam? Yes, what is piracetam? How is it? Yeah, uh, in, in piracetam is no, no tripil, is uh, like a, a, a cognitive enhancer. So I, I just will explain a little bit in the, in the talk that it uh, potentiates different types of uh, neurotransmissions. So not only a glutamatergic transmission, but also dopaminergic. GABAergic is, an, uh, is a molecule that is similar to GABA, uh, and it, it potentiates the uh, in, uh, binding sites of uh, uh, NMDA receptors. So it will increase the possibility of uh, glutamate or L-serine uh, to bind to the receptor. And this is something that uh, is given in, 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 pedi in uh, pediatrics, we normally give that to treat myoclonus, which is a, an abnormal movement, non-epileptic myoclonus, and it works. 
and 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 in beyond and near, uh, near pediatrics in adult neurology it is also given to patients with some forms of dementia or cognitive problems to enhance cognition and and also as a, and a stimulant some students take that to to be better at uh, when they have tests when they have exams so this is no triple thank you very much Thank you to all of you for joining us. Um, now we're gonna hear um, uh, a few words from our sponsors, Cure Green. Uh, so I'll give it to you, Keith, to um, do the, the next couple of minutes of presentation. And then we're gonna have just a closing remarks at the end. Uh, remind you that if you could uh, fill out, please the survey uh, in the chat so we know where you're coming from. And, um, and we want to thank Marita for the video that you saw during lunchtime and we have a chance to show it afterwards, it'll be great. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, thanks so much. And I, I want to just start by thanking Grin2B Europe Association for putting this together. Um, the sessions that I saw were, were just amazing. Thanks to all of the researchers. Um, I didn't get a chance to see everything yet, but I look forward to seeing the rest over the, the next couple of days. Um, the next thing I just wanted to give a, a quick uh, news update. I know that there's people here from all around the world, but I think we've all been um, losing priority over the last few days. We've been waiting to see what's what's been happening in the U.S. and uh, just well over the last uh, 15 minutes, CNN has called the election for Joe Biden. So I think we'll be able to uh, return to our productivity now. Um, I'm in I'm in Canada, but I but you know we're we're still obsessed over what's going on there here. It's uh, it's amazing. Um, so I wanted to talk to something, follow up on something that Amy had mentioned, which is that the associations need to help define the um, researchers' priorities. And we're kicking off a process now, and I just wanted to, to talk for a minute about how you can get involved. So the traditional model that rare disease associations use is that they begin with a request for proposals, and then researchers come forward and suggest ideas, and then the associations hand out funds to the project that sounds the most worthwhile. What we're doing is um, a little bit of a different process. This is based on, on something that uh, a physician who leads a rare disease association has come up with. It's, it's called, his name is, is David Fagenbaum, and so it's, it's the Fagenbaum model. And basically in this model, we start by consulting with families, researchers, and clinicians to identify the priorities, and then go out and find the best researchers to answer these top questions. Um, so here's kind of what we're, our process for doing it. So we've begun a research review where we are kind of summarizing all the work around GRIN that's been published already, or that we know is in progress in labs around the world. The next step is a consultation period with parents, researchers, and clinicians. And the main reason I wanted to highlight this today is because over the next, um, well, just, just before the end of the month, we're gonna be launching a survey uh, where we wanna get input from as many GRIN families as possible. This is really you know, your opportunity to help define GRIN research over the next few years. So we're gonna be asking questions, for example, like how should we balance our our focus on, you know, kind of short-term interventions that might only help um, with symptoms versus long-term uh, cures that could have a, a wider impact. Um, and then we're going to be asking, you know, how you would prioritize the concerns that you have about your child. Uh, is it more important to you to deal with um, seizures or to deal with um, visual impairment or to deal with uh, speech impairment. So we're going to be um, putting this all together, getting your feedback, and then um, we're doing another process with researchers and clinicians to, to get involved in this as well. And then we are going to be defining our research priorities, and then the final step is to go out and recruit the best researcher for each priority. So it may involve more uh, requests for proposals, um, but it, it uh, may be just knowing that there's you know, one person who can, can do this work that we need answered and going out and, and trying to get them uh, involved. So the best way for you to make sure that you're involved is to fill out the survey, and the best way to make sure that you're getting the survey is to make sure that you're on CureGrin's newsletter. Um, so go to our page at curegrin.org, scroll down, and you can see that there's a sign up button. 
at the bottom of the page for the newsletter. We've got about um, just over 200 families, I think, that are on there already, but we, we want to get as many families as we can before that launches. Um, where are the funds coming from for this? Well, we're doing a um, research uh, uh, fundraiser right now for, for research. We did one last November. We call it Count Me Grin. And we sign up families to try to help us go out to their own families and friends. Um, we're still looking for more families to help us with this campaign. It's called Count Me Grin. So whether you're able to um, help us by being what we call a Grin Champion and asking your contacts to donate or whether you are um, able to just make a donation on your own. Every dollar helps, and this is really the funds that we'll use to help us um, prioritize that, that you know, once we have those priorities, these are the funds that we'll be able to use for that. Um, and just one more thing that I wanted to mention, we have been putting together uh, a book of Grin stories that parents have submitted, and um, that book is also expected to go on pre-sale on Amazon, at the end of this month. So it'll be both in paperback and ebook through Amazon. Um, and so it'll make a great uh, holiday season gift. So um, watch for that. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about that. And I think that's everything. But thanks again to uh, all the researchers and to the Grin 2B Association, Europe Association. Well, Keith, thank you. Uh, very much and thank you for your support. Um, so we're trying to tack um, and, and unify our work as, as families. So we, I'm glad that we can join forces and try to get um, the opinion of all the families um, here and, and, and over there in North America. So um, I just wanna, one thing I wanted to ask you, please, uh, besides um, uh, filling out the survey, is we are trying to gather information about um, uh, attending physicians for your children, um, because we try to build a consortium uh, of neuropediatricians here in Europe um, that would better understand the disease of our kids, because we get a lot of uh, families um, concerned that you know they go to a neuropediatrician and 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 it's very tough for them because there's very little information out there. So um, and it has. It, it has shown to work really well uh, in hopefully future clinical trials, but certainly in the Elserine clinical trial. So if you guys would like uh, your neuropediatrician to join uh, this group, uh, please contact us uh, at the uh, green to be at, on Facebook, um, via email, uh, whatever way, uh, we would really appreciate appreciate it. Uh, we will put up uh, the, the video that you will briefly show during the lunch break um, that Marita made. Um, we will have it ready and we'll hang it on our uh, Facebook page for all of you to see and you can review and uh, there are actually important links there. If you need the links um, also they will be there um, for you to, to copy. So we will try to have like a, a, an actual copy of all the links next to the, the video publication. Uh, with that said I just want to thank our panelists for, um, for spending a good part of your Saturday here with us or basically your whole Saturday with us and again thank you uh, Cure Green for your support um, of this event because uh, I think without Calliope and Clarissa helping us um, I don't think we would have <laughs> this, this um, conference would not come out so nice um, but thank you very much and I know the rest cannot uh, applaud but I'll do <laughs> thank you <laughs>